Tracy Bone is a singer-songwriter from Winnipeg, Manitoba. She, along with a group of other Indigenous peoples, participated in Canada's Freedom Convoy, making music and blessing the protest day after day. This episode was recorded from the streets of Ottawa, where she and Chief J.D. Anderson continue to drum and pray. Tracy has said, We are not leaving until every man, woman, and child is guaranteed free. During our conversation, Tracy shares her journey of healing from sexual abuse and generational trauma. She relates it to the exchanging of stories at the Freedom Convoy about respecting bodily autonomy, honoring informed consent, and healing from the abuse of power. And then she invites Chief JD to share his insights on why the key to liberating Canadians is making sure that human rights are extended to all people including the true natives of the land. As some have tried to warn, intimidation can lead to physical abuse, to violence, which is what happened to convoy supporters on the front lines of the protest in its final days. One survivor is Candy Saro, a woman with a walker who shouted peace in the midst of the war the prime minister had set on his fellow people. This example of violence, among others, has sadly been a long time coming after more than a year of overreach and rhetoric that suppresses people who are unvaccinated for the coronavirus and experts who advocate for early treatment options. The medical freedom movement has been slandered and misrepresented, bank accounts of supporters have been frozen, arrests have been made, and still, Canadians continue to rally for health freedom in other parts of the country, unifying men, women, and children from different races, religions, and creeds. This isn't over. What brings all these people together, and why do they persist? In our interview, Tracy Bone explains a connection between the Freedom Convoy and the Every Child Matters movement. As the convoy raises awareness for the children who have been injured by vaccines, Every Child Matters raises awareness of thousands of Indigenous children found buried at Indian residential schools. Both uprisings in Canada connect for the sake of the children and to bring to light buried truth. Through this transcendent unity, we are given the opportunity to release the limiting belief that every person's physical material reality must be the same in order for them to be treated equal. I'm Sienna May Heath with Healed Warriors Tracy Bone and Chief J.D. Anderson. And this is Leaving the Left for Liberty. Hi, my name is Tracy Bone. My spirit name is Ignites the Fire, Saski So. I am here in Ottawa because I am a for many reasons, but mostly because I'm a, a sexual abuse survivor, now thriver. I've been healing for nine years. January 13th marks my, my healing. Uh, I'm here because of body autonomy. I mean, since I was six years old, my body has never been mine. From the time I was nine years old, my virginity was taken by someone I knew. Uh, since then, we have both uh, made that peace with each other because I understood that that happened to him as well. So. We were able to make that peace. Um, I understand that that doesn't always happen, but I'm here because I want, you know, the right to my body. Uh, everyone deserves that. My body was never my own, and now after nine years of healing, my body is mine, and I want to keep it that way. I want to have that freedom and that right to dream, you know, to live, and my hope is that everyone gives each other that chance to hear one another, to experience one another after two years of, of lockdowns. We are not the same people we used to be, none of us. So to give one another a chance to see each other, to hear each other's stories, to hear who we become today and how we can work together to build a strong foundation for this nation, the human nation. Always a good way to start is to you know, clear our minds and our energy to welcome spirits in and, you know, in the, in this uh, time of sharing, it's um, such good medicine to have around. So 
Thank you for asking me to do that. You know, I feel very connected to you every time I hear you speak or even see your image come up, your picture come up. I feel this fire and this warrior within you and perhaps the journey of going from the wounded healer to the healed healer is, is one that I'm on too. And I'd love to hear more about what's on your mind and your heart regarding this journey for you and perhaps the collective journey that we're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, to tell you that I love you and I understand, you know, the journey very well and that each of ours even though the paths are different all of it is you know leading to that same space you know that heart space that you know we've been so disconnected from you know by the seeds planted by the systems and to me, that's what connects me to people is that knowing and that going inward. And so, you know, I've had many people share their stories with me, you know, and I take that as uh, one of the many gifts that I've received on this journey, like the connection with you. And I just extend my love and my energy to you because I love the work you're doing and it's so important and um, you know what you do is you know you allow people to share their truth and that's of course why you know we're all here that's really as simple as it as it is and um, and as powerful as it is, you know, when we speak of the reasons and try to understand why the censorship and, you know, why all this energy being put into blocking the truth, that's how powerful it is. And we are in sharing these stories. It is, it is a, almost a battle of stories and it seems in this time of great censorship that some stories are deemed more worthy of others. Some stories are deemed more worthy of compassion and simply just being heard and being some stories being spread more widely than others for whatever reason. What is your story? Oh, uh, well, my first spirit name, I've actually been learning a lot about just while I'm here. Um, I'm still learning. Like I said, I mean, we're always learning, but as far as my first name goes, I'd like to introduce myself as which means to my understanding that I know today um, I received some English translations and right now um, it means the, the light that comes from the sun and um, I also have a second name that came to me actually in a dream and has been, I guess, somewhat confirmed to me many times. And that name is Saskiso. And that means ignites the fire. 
And so for me, I always, I don't know what it was. I think I just always knew that there was something magical. And um, I always kind of felt like I was maybe odd for thinking that, or it was the way that people made me feel about it. And so from like a really young age, I would um, take off to the, to the bush and play. So I was always, you know, on the land growing up in Southwestern Manitoba. And I loved it there. And, you know, a lot of people say, or their parents, um, you know, be careful out in the bush, you know, it's, it's dangerous or, you know, something could happen to you out there. But, you know, nothing ever did, you know, when in fact, that's where I felt the safest, you know, and considering, you know, the history of, you know, two of my grandmothers, my mom's mom and my dad's mom, both were prisoners of the residential school system. And... You know, like being out in the bush, it just contradicted what I was told about safety. Because of that intergenerational trauma, it was more scary to be at home. I mean, I'd say in a house <laughs> with people than it ever was to be out on the land where you know, bears and all these things, you know, possibilities of coyotes and whatever. Um, so I found that backwards. It just always felt like safety was on the land. And knowing that uh, through my experiences, I feared people more than I feared animals or the land or the water or anything only because of the things that would happen um you know what i understand now is you know the traumas that my grandmothers had endured the atrocities the abuse created that disconnection and you know through the programming the conditioning the continuous demeaning as children once I understood that part of the of the puzzle that I was trying to figure out then that gave me such insight and such understanding as to where it came from and those traumas you know why I say you know it was more safe in the bush than it was in a house with you know people is because of of those traumas and you know as we know you know with trauma there comes coping and the lack of coping skills that we were denied. You know, it's not that we didn't want to learn how to cope in a healthy way, but when you don't have, you know, an understanding of those skills or you were denied them and fed something else, it's hard to know hard to know how to deal with things so you know I, I understood that my grandmothers carried so much you know for for their families you know, their their truths for one you know and their their pain and one of my well my mother's grand or my mother's mom before she passed in February 
2020, just before all of this started, uh, you know, which I say is it was an actual blessing because of the time that we got to spend with her while she was dying. We could all be in the room with her and comfort her and comfort each other. And I know not a lot of people had that opportunity just a few weeks later. You know, so I trust in that divine timing. And I see that as one of the greatest gifts that myself and my family could have ever been given. So it made me even more compassionate and, and, and empathetic, empathetic to others and their dealings once March came and everything changed. March 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I saw a lot of that as gifts, you know, after the fact that we were given that time together to be with her because that's how strong she was, you know. She was 88 when she passed and like she, you know, lived a long life and is, is our matriarch and she is the embodiment of strength, you know, both of my grandmothers were. And because of, you know, the time I got to spend with my mom's mom, her being like my biggest fan ever. Uh, I'm a singer songwriter. So she always loved, you know, singing herself and both of my grandmothers did. Um, it's like when she left this world, like her spirit had almost, not almost, I, I'd say her essence felt like it was equally distributed amongst all of us in the family. So she didn't leave, you know, she gave us all a little spark of her. And to me, that's the foundation, you know, where I had to begin from was taking what they shared with me of their experiences. And, you know, they were such strong women and carried a lot, like I mentioned. And I realized only through that, that, you know, the strength of a woman the resiliency, the power, and the ability to not only give life, but, you know, nurture it to the best of your ability with whatever skills you have. My grandmother told me she wasn't able to tell her children that she loved them until she, or until they were adults. So something she didn't feel comfortable doing. And I was very familiar with that because I, I couldn't do that for a while. But then even when I did, it just like, not empty words because I didn't mean it, but it felt empty because I didn't understand love. So in addition to that, my, you know, I have a, uh, grandfather both my grandfathers are past now and one of them was a soldier and he was a paratrooper on the beaches of Normandy so I kind of look at all the directions of you know that uh, that lineage you know there's uh, a lot of pain and abuse and you know, through those experiences, you know, PTSD. So, but despite that, you know, their hearts were as wide open as, as they could um, have them. And that was the foundation and the understanding I needed to have to begin my journey to understanding my own pain and the roots of it so that I wouldn't carry, 
you know, that blame you know, to be angry at my mom because we couldn't communicate right, you know, mm-hmm. or angry because, you know, how come my dad isn't there all the time? And all these questions I had, and I had a, sort of a, I mean, I knew I was committing to my journey, but I also felt desperate. I had started with that anger. That's how I began my healing journey. Confusion. And I think the biggest thing was denial. Because that was my survival. (laughs) You know, and so that again goes back to the dangers. Because of the way that I would cope. So, you know, being around um, a lot of others ways or a lot of other people's ways of coping, like alcohol or drugs and um, all the many ways we, we, we deal um, when we're first. I um, guess maybe trying to escape. <laughs> mm. It sounds like as heartbreaking as some of this generational trauma was, you were given a gift to navigate the duality of separation and connection because in that separation you were you were almost forced to connect with nature and associate the natural world with freedom Mm -hmm. that's a beautiful way to to put it thank you (laughs) yeah thank you for sharing the story and i i imagine um maybe for some who aren't as in tune with their stories or maybe their stories are just different maybe they're wondering okay well what does this have to do with the collective or with the current event of the freedom convoy and i think one connection is um as you mentioned the the trauma that's happened at the indian residential schools particularly um, regarding the every child matters movement which is raising awareness for those uh, 215 indigenous children who were um, found buried at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And this is a piece of information that unfortunately gets lost in the news cycle. And that's why I think it's so precious that you're wearing that button on your hat, every child matters button, and we see signage at the freedom convoy of every child matters i've seen a sign on a truck perhaps you've seen more um it's it's coming up quite a bit at the convoy what do you feel is the connection between every child matters and the freedom convoy well From what I've felt and seen from being here from the beginning, you know, hearing the stories of everyone here, you know, I think the commonality in that is having children, you know, and I think that this maybe has even brought so much awareness to many people that, of course, you know, love their own children. But I think within these past two years of us all being kept apart, we've all, I feel, had such a a gift, I guess, in these two years to be with ourselves, you know, like time-wise and be with our fears and I feel like all of it has been a gift to soul searching everyone you know talks with me about every child matters um, or everyone who has I should say you know they've have they didn't really understand and you know honestly couldn't believe some of the stories that were coming out 
at the truth of the findings and you know understanding that they are children wounded children like inside you know the people that are sharing the stories so i think once they were able to sit with their own wounded inner child it made and allowed them to empathize with other wounded children that was my initial take on the stories that people would share and for that reason that they were given a gift to sit with themselves and their own traumas. It's only then that they can see, feel, have compassion for, and begin to understand and ask questions, you know, about, about everyone, about our people, about the every child matters, about, you know, the children and why they were lied to, like, there's just so many questions and again like I said like when I began my healing journey it was with a lot of denial so I understood that and then I was just kind of seeing the the process that you know we all go through when we're learning the truth sometimes it'll come out as anger like why didn't they tell us that you know from that to I'm so sorry. And then so there's people coming up, apologizing to us for, I guess, their ignorance. <laughs> mm. And I don't think ignorance as a, as a negative thing. It's where we all begin to heal. We realize that we've been ignorant. We, but we realize also from my experiences here and people sharing is that 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 was purposeful you know the miseducation the cover-ups the lies they're that's the world we're we're no where we're now stepping away from Exactly. It's, it's happening on a global scale. And so the microcosm of every child matters, it seems like, particularly in Canada, it's the key to unlocking that inner child healing and unlocking perhaps the, the guilt or the shame that comes with ignorance and creating a space where we can all be free to tell our stories and another, another part of the, the sentiment of every child matters that I feel is connected to the Freedom Convoy is the vaccine injuries that children have suffered. And perhaps you can relate to this where almost, I don't know that the numbers matter because if every child matters, mm. one, one child who is hurting matters the one 12 year old boy who I heard died from heart issues after taking a booster shot matters. The one 13 year old girl who was paralyzed after taking a Pfizer shot, she was in the trials, bravely stepped out in the trials. She's paralyzed now, she matters. Absolutely. And that's what it is. It's you know, I, I had to ask myself the question first before I could pose it, you know, to anybody else. But what does every matters mean to each of us? Does, and, and does that exclude anybody and why? You know, like our ancestors and, you know, my mother was a... Uh, also a, a prisoner of that system and she is alive today thankfully you know she's here and I wouldn't be otherwise but the I, I just feel like that connection is 
it's it's important it's important to to see and understand that we've all despite where you come from what direction what nation we've all been treated and um conditioned in some way so therefore we're all the same we're a, we're the human nation um a testing ground an experiment of sorts for them so that's the commonality i see and why another reason i'm here you know this is the the mission now is to find that commonality you know to see that each of us are humans we're spirits having a human experience but that we all have experienced trauma and yes some may be more uh known or over a longer period of time but when it comes down to it trauma is trauma and everyone has a wounded inner child at this point right now everyone is dealing with that wounded inner child learning to comfort that child to give ourselves what the program had hoped we had we would never have you know the connection between our divine feminine energy you know the nurturing the mother that the purpose purposefully worked on to break that connection mm-hmm. in emotion nurturing and communication and skills and then of course on the divine masculine side our fathers you know i had to do a lot of work in that area as well so the similarities between us all as spirits having a human experience we came here knowing and understanding that to be human is actually the revered by a lot of of other beings which is why we chose to come here so we could experience the deepest darkest lightest emotions that one could ever experience and we're here to ask some profound spiritual questions that i think still fit into the 3d system that we're slowly breaking out of for instance what is the greater good what does it mean if if something is allegedly for the greater good of all, what does it mean if it hurts one person or hundreds of people or thousands of people? It, what does it mean to say every child matters? And what does it mean for you, Tracy, to say something is for the greater good? Well, for one, there is no exclusion. the greater good includes all not the rejection of one for any conditioning or beliefs of a self. to become your own leader by way and by, and through the heart i think the greater good cannot include discrimination you know those ideas of separation division it's important it was important for me to understand how crucial it was that i don't just use these eyes <laughs> but that i use you know my connection through my healing to understand that so the greater good came from my heart and the time and space that the creator gave to me to be with my pain to learn to comfort and nurture 
that wounded inner child because I learned that when I did that for me as an energetic being, as a Reiki master, having an understanding of energy, as much as I wanted to go out there and you know, fix everyone else because I'm coming from a space of codependency. I had to have help to go in here and break that cycle so that I could understand my perception, just mine, of mm -hmm. the greater. And another form of codependency, which I'll admit I'm experiencing, and I think many people are, is being mm -hmm. codependent on the news. I'm not codependent on mainstream news, frankly, but I, I will say I am, I am very, I feel very tied to the pain of what's happened in Ottawa over the weekend, the police brutality, the trampling of a woman on a walker. How, I, you know, I've heard you speak about through your healing journey, you, you, you've, you're coming to a place where you can identify with anyone's anger, for instance, even the anger of those police officers who I, I feel they've been coerced into behaving that way. I think they perhaps are victims of this system as well, but they have made a choice to behave poorly and to inflict violence. How are you reckoning with, how are you reckoning with what's happened over the weekend? Well, I've come to my own space in, in my heart and my mind of peace. And that has been a valuable gift to me because it's, also nurtured my faith so prior to coming out here I had a lot of tests a lot of challenges that um, prepared me and didn't make as much sense as it does today but I knew that I needed to understand ego and I needed to understand you know, the darkness. And the only way that I was able to do that, like I mentioned, was to understand my own so that I could see and have compassion for others, recognizing where they're at on their journey. So I think I allow, you know, I am not in control of anyone or anything except myself. And that's like you mentioned, the codependency that you and I, you know, can relate to. And many people have. So that's brought me a lot of peace is just understanding my own codependency, my own fears, especially, you know, coming from poverty mindset and, you know, not ever really knowing where I'm going to get uh, food sometimes from like living in my vehicle for a couple of years and you know those were they sound terrible in a sense but at the same time it was the most exhilarating and exciting and challenging um, time and gifts that I could have been given so it's my faith that I feel like I built, which allows me to allow others to go through their journey without, you know, um, trying to control anything. That brings up a commonality that I'm seeing. In addition to, I think many of us in the health freedom movement understand abuse recovery. We also, or many of us understand what it's like to suffer in other ways, or maybe not even suffer, but just face challenges um, and maybe do so willingly. 
I, I heard what you just said about living in your car reminded me of something I heard a trucker say the other day. He said it with great humility and, and not really with anger, but he just said, I don't think they know who they're dealing with. <laughs> I, I, I've, I know how to live in my truck for days, weeks on end. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. He said that toward the very beginning. And as we know, they lasted quite a while. Um, and I've heard similar sentiments from an Iranian immigrant who's been marching with you. He's, he said in, in another way, he's like, they don't know who they're dealing with, maybe. I've been, he said, I've been tortured in prison in my home country and now I'm here. I'm not, I, I got the sense not to put words in his mouth, but I got the sense that he was not afraid of dying. Yes. I'm glad you said that because that actually came to my mind while you were speaking, making peace with death. You know, that was one of the major things that I saw in those two years while we were all kept apart was that I needed to make complete peace with death and understanding that, you know, that there's always, without death, there is no birth, right? There's always the cycles. We follow, I follow. And in order to do that, it was, um, they brought me to a challenge with my daughter, my youngest daughter who faced near death herself. Uh, also, she uh, faced a lot of addictions and I learned to support and stand by her side and not control her process as a mother. That was really heartbreaking because, and as someone who's, you know, healing from codependency, I wanted to just fix everything for her, but I was taught to step back, which was really hard to do, to allow my daughter to learn her own lessons, to face her own consequences, to make her own decisions, even though I knew some of them where they may lead, but to just allow. And I just prayed and I cried and I prayed and I cried. <laughs> That's pretty much all I could do, right? So to get myself to the place where I made peace with, you know, the fact that we don't know when that day is going to come, but until then, you know, this is what I choose to do. And this is what I commit to learning is breaking those cycles. And yeah. yeah, that will always be. Yeah. And I think why the story of Candy Saro, the woman who was trampled by police officers on horses at the convoy, I think the reason why her story really stuck with many of us is there's, there's a feeling of she could be me. She is me. She is you. She is all of us. It's such a symbol for the, the trampling on the soul of humanity, trampling mm -hmm. on our sovereignty, and with such mercilessness and obvious fear, even on the horse's part, I could tell that the horses were afraid. I watched that clip a lot, many mm -hmm. times, and they, they were afraid. And I, I wonder if the horses were not backed by the police had the, maybe the horses would have gone back maybe that's maybe mm. that's foolish to think but I just wonder if we lived in a more natural world if our systems were more connected to nature and spirit and animals in their highest forms maybe maybe we wouldn't have that that police brutality, among other forms of brutality against one another. Um, and I also, I wanted to ask you, do, can you confirm that Candy Saro is a full-blood Mohawk woman? Um, I can uh, actually, I, I can't confirm that. I don't know 100% um, of her lineage. Um, yeah, but I do whole, I do wholeheartedly, you know, feel what you were feeling about the whole situation. 
I, I wouldn't like to speak on something I don't I don't fully know myself. Yeah. But, uh, tell, tell me more about your experience at the convoy, what you've seen in terms of division and also a great embodiment of unity, unity in race, religion, gender, thought, choice. Tell me more about what you've experienced at the convoy. There's, I mean, uh, I've, I've experienced definitely some division, you know, um, just by my observation and by my um, energetic body telling me things and my intuition. I've uh seen some forms and uh, of that you know within people and again i understand you know where it comes from it's confusion fear and uh yeah you are absolutely right i mean if people and when people are and do get connected to their spirit because you know in my opinion and in my experiences I wasn't connected to mine at one point. And so I can completely relate to that division. It's to me, the division is within the self. If you are divided within, you know, from yourself and who you are, even the understanding of who you are, how can you possibly connect with anything on the, on the outside world or of the, of the natural world? So mm -hmm. I just shows me how much work needs to be done you know, in, in each individual, uh, it's really recognizable to me, like I said, because I've done that work on myself. And how, um, I'm just thinking, yeah, just to, to elaborate on the division, I, I agree, I, I, I do see that division as well as unity starts from within. Yeah. Um, and, and to deepen on the division that you've witnessed at the Freedom Convoy, have you come into contact with any counter protesters? No, not me personally. <laughs> okay. Just media stuff, of course, I, I see, but I have not, you know, physically been in in those lines as uh, if that's what you're referring mm -hmm. to. But what are you witnessing in the media in terms of division and counter protesters? Um I guess a lot to do with the narrative, you know, that uh, is being pushed out there. Again, some of the, the, some of the programming, and then also we're seeing some truth about people. I mean, uh, with the situations, you know, we're speaking about, you were mentioning candy, you know, our life giver. Um, like I said, like it's the division is, uh, yeah, just within the people and, and it has to go this way. Mm. It has to go this way. It's, it's part of the process, you know, from being divided, you know, within the self, of course, we project that out and we sometimes um, energetically, attract those types of experiences because we have a lesson deeper to learn about about it so yeah the division is, to me it's many layers and uh, you know right from the self to the projection of everything but uh it's it, it needs to go the way it's going so that everyone can work out their own traumas unfortunately it's in ways of violence sometimes you know as we were speaking about earlier but uh again it, it was part of my process too you know i used to be a raging violent person and it's not doesn't excuse my toxic behavior and it doesn't excuse theirs and each of us are to face our own consequences and we have choices to to make we have free will to learn and that's the gift right now to focus on. Mm -hmm. And it seems nearly, if not every community is divided on this issue. Are you experiencing division 
and conflict within your communities of indigenous peoples? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like I mentioned, we all, um, like our grandmothers, our grandfathers, you know, my mother, our aunties, uncles, you know, many have been in those, um, in those systems, those prison systems disguised as school systems, educational systems that, you know, ingrained all of division within the children. So of course, in the first, you know, five years of your life, you know, that's what my grandmother held on to. I remember her telling me was her first five years because in that time, that's when so much was of that love that she felt from her family before those times. Uh, that's what kept her strong. So when she went in, it really flipped her world upside down. And so, of course, you know, that that is going to have an effect, you know, on our people. And that's why I felt it was so important for me to be able to understand the root. Where does, where does the root lie? It doesn't, it didn't lie within, you know, oh, you know, my mom doesn't want me or my dad doesn't care, you know, that unfortunately was, you know, a result of the disconnection that they successfully, you know, planted and programmed within, you know, our mother's our fathers, our grandparents, our relatives, you know, the ones being found and still unearthed and there will be more. Mm -hmm. So naturally, so to speak, that is gonna affect each and every one of us. And that's why I, I always make it a, a point to encourage people to go within. We were all taught that it's selfish to put ourselves first. To me, everything that we've been taught is backwards from the truth. And of course, planned, purposeful, to keep us disconnected and not knowing who we are. But it was important for me to understand the root cause so that that's where I began was at the root. And that's what I encourage everyone to do. Go to the root. Why is, why this disconnection? Where did it come from? And so did that work, I started to understand myself. So, of course, there's division in the communities. And actually, there are many, well, I can speak on one solidly, um, you know, in the northern Manitoba, where a lot of the women had gone against being locked down. Uh, they had been in need of supplies for their children, as well as food, diapers, those sorts of necessities. And the community had put, uh, you know, restrictions, uh, even not allowing them to, to go and shop for themselves. So they would, um, they delegated a certain area to a shopper, and they would have to be the ones to go out and get their supplies. But, you know, there's also a lot of people sometimes living in one household and you know we've got growing kids that eat a lot and need that nutrition and um so some of the mothers went out uh, and they went and got the supplies that they needed for their their children and their families and they um, upon their return they had a really difficult time being allowed back into their own community because they had blocked them from being able to do the basic thing by taking care of their children, their needs, their basic needs. So the understanding of that root and where that comes from, then we understand more about the confusion. You know, we understand more about the plan they had and how well it worked in some cases, like, for me, if I didn't start, like I didn't start my healing till I was 38 years old, you know, so it's never too late for anybody to begin. And I've been doing this for nine years and it was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. I've lived, I've died many times, ego deaths, realizations, realizing I knew nothing, you know, have, not having social skills that I should have had at five years old, but being denied that because it wasn't taught and offered to my, my, my mother and my grandmother. And that 
in itself just cleared so much anger and, and resentment, you know, for behaviors I couldn't understand. So the root, getting to the root, seeing the division between families, you know, it's, it lies in my understanding in our fears. You know, the fear of abandonment, the fear of judgment, carrying shame, all of those things that they planted within those young minds. Mm -hmm. That was the weapon that they used. And we see the results of that today. And so that's what I've committed to is healing, healing through understanding the root of the problem and understanding the division and seeing it for what it is, but also recognizing, you know, when people reconnect with themselves and seeing all the beautiful work they're doing on themselves. And I understand that the part, the process is very painful, but again, you know, like that, uh, a few of those men you said that you have lived in their vehicles and they've been through, you know, all of these um, challenges and, and, you know, traumas and we've become so strong. We've developed coping skills. We learn new coping skills so that we're not dealing with things the same way and perpetuating the same cycles over and over and over again. And, and listening to you speak about that heartbreaking situation in Manitoba and, and linking it to your own experience of healing from abuse, what comes to mind is a phrase, a crisis of consent. Hmm. To me, what you're describing and what we're experiencing on a massive scale on our continent in our continent of North America, in Canada and the United States uh, and elsewhere, I think we're experiencing a crisis of consent. So within the situation of the Freedom Convoy, dissenters or counter protesters might say, well, we didn't consent to have this so-called occupation in our streets. And we don't see anything wrong with mandates or with a store deciding how they want, um, how they want their employees or their customers to dress or if they want them to be vaccinated. And they feel like, I think it's interesting to me because while I'm definitely on the side of medical freedom, I also see sort of the same language and the same frustrations on the other side. They're saying, we did not consent to this. This is disrupting our lives. This is disrupting our economy. This is our, disrupting our peace. And they see it, they have seen it as an infringement on their freedom which is so, despite the frustration I feel, like I also find it fascinating that we, we hear a lot of this same sort of language. Like, how dare you infringe on my space? And, and we're like, yeah, how dare you infringe on my space? That's what we said originally. That was the, that's the point of this. How dare you tell me what I should put into my body? And really, I think it goes beyond the physical. It's like, how dare you tell me what it means to be a good person? And how dare you tell me how to define the greater good based on your physical material definition. Mm. When you hear that phrase, a crisis of consent, what comes up for you? A crisis of consent. Mm. I don't know, the thing that just came to my mind as you were speaking, though, was like, how dare anyone, um, how dare, how dare you disrupt my comfort? From my own experiences, I've, I've learned that I had a lot of resistance to people ever you know coming at me to disrupt my comfort my comfort sometimes was chaos because it's what well, was familiar and that I was offended by even though I wasn't holding on to something that might have been good for me 
in that moment, it's what I needed to survive, I felt or thought. So I think the crisis is more about that, the inner crisis, the battle that we see playing out is, is that crisis, you know, within. And it's uh, like, you know, we were talking about earlier, the, that's the similarity. I like to focus on, on that. Yeah. I think that's yeah. And, and and the reason why I felt called to reach out to you was I, I saw your video at the convoy one of the first days. You spoke about why you came, why you felt called to join the Freedom Convoy. And it was because you know what it's like to suffer from sexual abuse, you know what it's like to survive. And you know what it's like to thrive. Mm -hmm. And you, I, I sensed from the way you were speaking that you really value the holiness of the human vessel and what that represents. And, and I think that's why the, the, the word consent was coming up for me because that, that's, I feel that that's the crisis of sexual abuse is that consent is violated and we mm -hmm. see this too now on a global scale regarding vaccination where it's the same thing really in essence like how dare you how dare you violate my vessel or how dare you try to coerce me to succumb to something that doesn't feel right to me what parallels do you see between your experience of sexual abuse and what we're seeing on a global scale? Well, I, I hear and feel what you mean now about the consent. Like it's, I mean, to me, it's about that body autonomy, you know, and it really is about respect. There's, I feel, just from my own experience, I didn't understand what respect meant. So therefore, I was just as guilty of violating my own body in many ways as others were violating mine. And so I had to make peace with that too. That helped me to change my perspective and also see how that affects those effects have, have really, how the, how much it's, it's really affected other people, you know, not having that choice. I mean, can even go deeper than that and talk about conscience and the levels of consciousness, you know, um, at playing a huge role in how we see consent or who or what we've consented to, how we've crossed and, and hurt ourselves, uh, how we've allowed that from others and why. You know, boundaries were huge, huge in this healing process for me. And when I, I imagine as anybody else, if you don't have boundaries, how in the world <laughs> put them another person or learn respect you know to respect yourself is love and so that's how i see it playing out in the in on this planet is to really go within to have and and cultivate your understanding and and you know in, of respect of true respect of self then you can have that and understand that and why it's important for others to um, to give that to them too. Mm, you can only give what you already have. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and this brings up the wisdom 
and the reverence for survivors of abuse, I think sometimes uh, there's a, a limiting belief that, oh, maybe survivors of abuse or trauma are too blind to see through it and they're triggered and we need to help them suppress it rather than help them bring it to the surface and see what wisdom is there. What is the wisdom in those wounds? Mm. And, and I found myself thinking about this recently because um, I saw there was a study out of Wales that linked vaccine hesitancy to childhood trauma. And it caught my eye because I actually think they're onto something. However, I feel that it's that study from what I've seen of it, I haven't read the whole thing, but from what I've seen, it seems to be rooted in that limiting belief that we need to help these people understand rather than look at the wisdom that these people bring and consider why it is they're so skeptical of these old systems and maybe that they are right, so to speak. I don't like speaking in right and wrong, but mm -hmm. in this case, it does seem like it seems very one-sided that they would say, oh, these poor people, they, they have this link and we need to help them understand. We need to help them put this thing in their body. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost absurd in its inversion, but I also see some wisdom in that link. At least they're seeing the link. And I wonder if there's a way to turn it around and say, yes, yes, I, I acknowledge what you're saying. I acknowledge what you're finding. However, what if the wisdom is actually in listening to the lessons learned from these survivors? And that's, that's really, really a huge part of it. You know, it, uh, it took me a long time to be able to share my story, you know, but in divine timing when I was ready, you know, so that's exactly where the wisdom will come from, you know, is being able to, you know, connect with the power of your experience despite the heaviness and pain that came with it. Learning to sit with your emotions that come up from those experiences and traumas, that is where the wisdom lies. And again, that's just my experiences. It's where I found that, that deep knowing and understanding forgiveness and wisdom and faith. So seeing and hearing people share their stories as they come into their own divine timing mm -hmm. and their own time where no one controls it except their own internal, you know, knowing. To mm -hmm. me, that greatest gifts that people can share of one another and, of each, and to, um, I guess come into that 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 power that 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 understanding the power of their stories and their experiences. I think that that's a, a golden thread that we can all weave together, and I think that's what's happening right now. Absolutely, and I was looking closer at the similarities um, between the freedom convoys and the freedom movements in Canada and the US, which I think are obvious, but there's, there's some key differences that might explain the, the control, the top-down control that's happening in Canada that God willing will not happen here, um, but it's something to consider. And I, I looked at Canada's motto. Canada's motto is peace, order and good government. The United States motto is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hmm. Canada's motto, when I hear peace, order, good government, I'm all for peace. Um, but when paired with the word order, 
and then good government, you know, backing the government rather than the people, which we have more of that language in the US, it's, you know, power to the people. Um, what do you think is in that motto that might explain why the roots of Canada sort of favor the, the tyranny and the top down control that we're seeing coming from the government now? Well, I don't know who penned that. <laughs> oh, okay. I would, I would love to be able to, um, at the time, um, introduce you to someone who can really explain um, and speak further and in more depth on exactly what you just asked me. Perfect timing. Thank you. It is actually. So I'd like to introduce you to Chief J.D. Anderson, and I'll uh, give you to him to introduce himself. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Oh, who's you? Uh, usually say in the district pass, all our relations. I'm uh, Chief J.D. Anderson. Uh, also... My uh, traditional name is Blue Rattle Buffalo Man. Uh, that was given to me in the Dakota ceremonies from the White Buffalo Calf Society. <clears throat> Last year. Prior, prior to that, I was uh, Gypsy to Tusi's Little World went in Greek. And that was uh, presented to me uh, through uh, a naming ceremony. Uh, during teaching lodges and that uh, from the uh, little Pegwis area where I held lodges and teaching teaching lodges up in, in that area back in the 90s. Uh, now, I over, I was sitting here listening to some of the conversation and, and what was uh, transpiring with respect to the constitution process that I were in place of 1763 peace, order, and good governance. Uh, it wasn't good government. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a reference to good governance. Now, being part of the redrafting of the 1982 Constitution with uh, uh, so, some of the family members and uh, community members in Winnipeg with uh, Senator Murray Sinclair back prior to that when he was going through his... Uh, legal uh, process we were given the task of redrafting that process so the inclusion to the peace order and good governments came from the 1763 process which is called the indian magna carta or the bna act of north america and in that process the i was stating that as we move on to define a fair and just society we have to have inclusionary perspectives from the past, present, and into the future. Now, still today, Canada is, has not been properly ratified with the inclusion of the Indigenous counterparts that were here on this land. And that is through the clans mothers, also the, the patriarch and matriarch societies. And without that, it cannot be done because the lands are still unceded. The Hudson's Bay did not sell those rights as they proclaimed to have. And it is in, uh, a proxy in front of uh, the British government. And uh, that was never ratified in 1867. I've got two documents that prove that. And I've presented them. I wrote to Her Majesty, met with Prince Charles and mid 90s and uh, drafted out many other inclusionary perspectives to languages. The essence is we were watching the US and what had transpired in the erosion of the economic perspective. Now, our belief is, and it always has been, that government has no business being in business. Their only subjective compliance 
is to provide regulation and protection to the citizens of their 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 freedoms and liberties on a constitutional basis. The thing that has separated separated the continent and its people is exactly that. The businesses in both areas, the North and South, the United States and Canada, have a right to develop their own businesses and their own protocols in doing, and that's in, in fair trade and any types of other treaties, both intercontinental as well as international. Now, you can go back into that. What has created that separation and divide, as, as you were asking? And uh, when uh, the people are raped, pillaged, and, er and eradicated, to change the spiritual essence of their belief system. Even though all the churches have been allowed to establish themselves because they were invited to participate and to be shown a fair and just process, those things were forgotten on, a, on an equality basis of true measures. And that comes under the laws of maximum equity. So those types of things have to be readdressed, reformulated in the best possible processes that are going to derive a constitutional provisional process that's an acceptable quality to all the people in North America. And we are the people in joint unison that have to lead that way to creating the fair and just society based on a process of equity, of assurance, that it's going to be developed for the children, the children's children, and the seven generations. And that creates a lot of anxiety in the people because that takes a lot of work. But we have to leave it to, to the mothers and the grandmothers as well, because that was the intent of the dialogues that were presented. It was not to be solely a patriarchal society. It was a matriarch society that we were governed on and based upon. And that relationship that we share with our, our pipes and other areas of traditional beliefs and concepts are that unison of, of female and male continuation for life. We're, we're supposed to be respecters of life and, and living in, in its proper perspective. Those things have been a grave failure due to residential schools, due to the, uh, all the other practices. Those children were never given a chance to a right to life. It was stripped from them and their voices are silent and every child matters. Being a, a survivor myself and a victim to, to those types of abuses by the nun, and also the full sodomization, and, and that it took me close to 50 years to disclose those. There, there's, there, and they preyed on that, on that with a lot of the victims. through shame, guilt, based on religion and belief, and instilled those fears. And they still use that to, to divide and conquer the people emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And it's a sad state of affairs. And you go back through history, you'll see, you'll see that exact same thing in other international nations of how that was adopted as a process. And it's become systemic. And that's why we're here today, standing up as human beings on this earth and saying, enough is enough. And it's just that simple. No more victimization. And we're looking for an equality of process that gives us a better way to govern ourselves as human beings and a more moralistic fabric 
of understanding with each other. And that brings about peace and unity because we've all been victimized in one form or another by whatever reason or rationale that we can put. And we can always find the devil's advocates or uh, even within ourselves that will come back and bite us. But when we put it up with the creator and we're walking in a good, solid spiritual condition, we have no better way to bring that forward. And that's through the love, the seven sacred teachings that we've been gifted with here on, in North America. You know, and the rest of the world has a lot of similar beliefs and understanding from the, their traditional concepts. But those have been stomped on and many are pilfered and, and uh, <clears throat> destroyed. So as they themselves are led into disbelief or uh, a non-compliance in, in the best sense of the words, because they're da darned if they do and they're, they're darned if they don't. <laughs> I try not to swear, <laughs> but it's very difficult sometimes uh, when uh, we're, we're going through or we get the heated or highly tempered when we, we were forced to have to step forward and, and bring these things. So uh, I'll let you ask some questions and it'll help me come back to, to maybe answering other things that you might be concerned or interested in. Thank, thank you for sharing. And I'm wondering, um, you had suggested a, a prevent, a provisional sort of, are you suggesting that the US and Canada come together to, um, in a way, amend the charter? Okay. We each have our own separate charters. The okay. uh, was based on the, on the different covenants that were presented. And so they have the, the governmental bodies and, and the upper senates of each floor, but there's not a basis of true equality for, for uh, First Nations or Indigenous people. They're by appointment. So that creates an unfair process. So the upper Senates have to be readdressed and uh, proper ratifications made to each government body especially from the House of Representatives as well. Mm. So we have those types of similar concepts between Canada and the U.S., but there's a definite body that needs to be put into place to regulate those processes of, as well. Okay, understood. And, and you were speaking about equality and equity, what is the difference between those two things? Equality is on, a, on an individual basis. And a right of business or a right of personal affairs. Also between people. So when we put those into perspective, there, there's a duality or a parity of law that falls into place. And the equity is the basis of shared provisionary concepts and informed processes where we can make informed decisions on a reasonable area of, of development between ourselves as reasonable people. And uh, being uh, involved with peace, order, and good governance, those are the essential processes, and we have to deal with them from a spiritual contact of inclusionary perspectives. Mm. And so on the surface, the principle of good governance may sound like good government. Thank you for correcting me. Um, but what I'm hearing from you and from Tracy is that the, the spiritual component of good governance is governing oneself so that you can create a more equal and equitable society. Yes. Okay. 
And, oh, yeah, please, deep, go on. Deep down within every one of us is that fundamental idea. So what are we lacking in our lives is, is our spiritual connection to Mother Earth and, and our surroundings as well as into ourselves so we can deal with those from a uh, proper balance metaphysical level. Mm. And when we find those, we can't undo the awareness or the truths that we have to encounter individually as well as for each other. Mm. Mm. And reflecting on this motto of peace, order, and good governance, and also on the United States, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, does an indigenous motto come to mind? Oh, yes. We've, we've got some solutions, but we have to be willing to work with, along with one another. We've got a, a whole uh, country on both sides that uh, are addressing a lot of upheavals. But most of all, we have to settle the upheavals within ourselves on an individual basis, as well as as uh, ourselves within our communities and people that are responsible for for bringing that that into effect. And there are a lot of good societies, a lot of good solutions that are, have been forwarded and lived by since the beginning of times in ancient ways of living in peace, harmony, and goodwill with each other. Mm. Uh, another idea that comes to mind um, comes from the Hopi tribe, the third shaking of the earth. Could this be the third shaking of the earth that we're experiencing now? Very well could be. Uh, but only as we trans transition into that that swing of the universe going back into the, into its orbital process of of, uh, of pathways and alignments. Uh, I I'm not too too familiar with all of that, but I can feel it feel it in my system when I'm I'm over ninety percent water. <laughs> I get twisting just like any other human being, and I got a bad proper perspective. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, the, the limbs uh, of humankind. Yeah, the limbs of humankind are shaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've seen footage from the Freedom Convoy by some Indigenous peoples uh, referring to the Rainbow Warriors. Footage of um, perhaps some of you have only seen it in passing, but um, Indigenous peoples drumming in the streets and being deemed rainbow warriors. That comes, as you know, from the Hopi prophecy of the warriors of the rainbow rising up of every race, gender, creed to make the earth green again. Are you sensing that rainbow warrior energy at the Freedom Convoy? People can feel it because. In their lives, they they have some mixture of of Aboriginal descendancy, or Indigenous descendancy, or human beings of this nation, the original people, and it's not one distinct society that has that that onus of of development of being greater than or, or better than. We are all one. Uh, under one one power greater than ourselves, a universal power that that unites us. And when we come to that realization that that's what we have to trust in, something is is greater than than myself and greater than others, and we find it in ceremonies as well as we journey through the mystical motions that that we we go through and as different rites are given to us, our I. T E yes. <laughs> yes, right. Yes. Uh, and tell me more about the experiences you're having at the convoy. Are, are you there now? Are you among protesters? Uh, right from the get-go and also in the beginning in the development of it with, with the convoy in motion and preparing for it. Also in the letters that I drafted to the sovereignty 
with regards to proper sovereign processes and taking that that right back as an inherent signatory. Mm. And and what have you experienced at the convoy from the start to where you are now? Elated happiness <laughs> and the feeling of, of a blessing from within that there's hope. And that hope can be better developed and, and promoted in, in a good united process of unity between the people in all different ways and all different levels. And people are, are at that space. And I think that's what people are referring to in that acknowledgement from all races and all of, uh, all of that body embodiment that I mentioned at the beginning. When we talk about that, those three essences that are there, you talk about the, the three leaves uh, that are, are shown to us. And that represents mom and dad and the child or the unknown one. And when we come into to being, we, we bring this along into the tree of life. And so we're, we're grounded and rooted and we can stand tall. And when we're a part of that, we, we slowly find what we have to contribute, whether it be the oxygen or or the ill effects of going back and, and going through that recycle movement if we're a part of the leaf or if we stay grounded within the roots. <laughs> hmm. And the unity at the Freedom Convoy is, is obvious to many who are watching. Unity of race, gender, creed, thought, choice. And, and yet there's still this barrier. You know, not everyone can step into that unity. What do you think is that barrier that's stopping some people from joining this movement? Self-denial. From, from their true connections. And so their awareness and, and growth. And it's they're all under the same belief, you know, that there's something better, but the, we'll stick with this. So that's the, the platitude that, that they allow themselves to go to, where they cannot see anything more than, than what is before them. And some people have that right to, to be in that space. You know, we cannot change the minds, but we can change the direction and the flow for the future. Mm. Have you been experiencing any disagreements among Indigenous peoples regarding the Freedom Convoy? Oh, for sure. That's what they use to separate and divide. <laughs> it's a great motion of tactic that they've used. And uh, it's a it becomes a sad state of affairs when when we pick up on it and know what what's being pushed to, as an agenda on the forefront. Uh, so we, we see it within our own people. We see it in, in the vast majority of people, but we have, we have a strong majority of people that are standing up when they're called upon because deep down inside of them, they, they all know the injustices and you can't cover all of those truths up or on just truths. Mm. And as parts of the truth are being revealed and the United States is joining this movement, um, the, the convoy has set out just the other day here in the United States. What message do you have to truckers and protesters in the United States as they move forward and join you? Keep the, the simplicity of things, own inner conscience and our belief system that we're here in it together for peace and unity, harmony, and the love that we all need to prevent
a lot of the animosity as well as for all nations internationally to to witness that we're still all here together as a, a united body of people. Thank you. Um, you broke up there a little bit at the end, and I just want to make sure we got that on recording. Do you mind if I just ask the question one more time and you can can say say your answer? Ready? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. I got a good mind, but a short memory. <laughs> All right. We'll see what comes out. <laughs> All right. Well, what message do you have to give? to the truckers and the protesters joining the Freedom Convoy in the United States? To stay united as a nation, for a nation, by a nation, for a whole nation, in the process of unity on an international front as well. When, we, when we're together in our own embodiment of love, joy, happiness towards freedom and true liberty, for each other and the future of the, the next seven generations, we're setting an example of why our forefathers gave their lives for our freedoms and our liberties. And that is something that we have to hold dear. You know, they've been forgotten in a lot of cases and we keep forgetting that that was the process that they stood up against the ter tyrannies of other, other countries that were trying to do this exact same thing. And if we allow those social injustices to create more social ills, then we're at fault as human mm -hmm. beings. So we have to ask ourselves from within how far we're willing to go as individuals. That is the question. Yeah, how far is each person willing to go? And seeing the the government in Canada freeze accounts of protesters and seeing how the police force descended on protesters over the weekend, what do you think is is perhaps on the horizon and what choices might we have to make as Canadians and Americans? That is uh, one of the questions from within each individual that they have to weigh that out as well as talking with one another because it's in that, that uh, conversation with each other that we, we come out with the truth and we see it, that disposition of unnatural justice. That is not fair and just. Uh, how a fair and just society is to be operating, especially when we have democratic processes in place that say that we have a right to address these on, on a fair and equal basis, and that our rights are not to be be watered down or, or stomped upon. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Thank you very much. Bless you. Same with you. Thank you, Hello. Tracy. Hi. <laughs> it's my honor and my pleasure uh, to speak with you, connect with you. I just want to thank you for... Um, and having such a such a loving and important and um, warming uh, energy as well uh, on this on this journey to allowing us to share our experiences and our truth uh, with the rest of the world. And I thank you for all your work. I wish you well in your healing and I will keep you in my prayers and from sister to sister. I, I love you. And I thank you for your being. Thank you, Tracy. I love you too. Sister to sister. I am eternally grateful for your courage 
your vulnerability, your storytelling and your perseverance. You just keep going. You told me almost 30 days ago that you are staying until all the people are free. And I can tell in one form or another, you are staying. And I am so grateful for the work that you're doing in Canada. And just know those of us that cannot join you in person, we are with you in spirit and we are not stopping either. We love you. Thank you so much. That means a lot. And that's everything like, you know, the prayers are strong and I know this and we know this and um, it's equally as, as important and um, helpful in this, in this journey to unity. So thank you. Yes, the human nation. Yes, the human nation. Yes. Bless you, Tracy. Bless you, Chief. Oh, thank you. Be well. You too.